Uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about meteors, partly because I happened to just see one the other night and partly because there's all sorts of cool things about them. Like, for example, there's even a theory that if you listen really hard, you can hear them. We'll come to that later, will we? Yeah, I should think so. All right, where are we going to start? Let's talk about why you see them in the first place. I saw one the other night. There is one of these things called a meteor shower that's about to happen. Although they peak on a particular night, they tend to be spread out over several weeks. So this is probably just one from that particular meteor shower. There are probably, what, half a dozen bright meteor showers a year. There are actually dozens and dozens of these meteor showers, but most of them are too wimpy and pathetic to see. And they're predictable. Entirely predictable, happen on almost exactly the same date. Uh, the thing that's not quite so predictable is how impressive they're going to be. So we have to go back to think about another astronomical phenomenon, things called comets. Like comets are these dirty snowballs that whiz around the solar system. Some of them take hundreds of years, some of them take thousands of years or even longer to orbit around. And they're these dirty snowballs, so there's icy material full of little grains of sand and bits of dirt and bits of carbon. And as they come close to the sun, that snowball starts to vaporise and you end up seeing this trail of material coming off. But of course that material just gets left behind. And as well as the water ice in there, there are all these little bits and pieces of silicates, so grains of sand effectively, and carbon that get left behind in the orbit. So the comet orbits around with its nucleus, but it leaves this trail behind it of bits of muck, of soot, of of small carbon grains, small sand grains, those kinds of things. And of course, that uh, orbit just sits there. And some of these orbits for the comets, the Earth intersects with. And all you're seeing when you see a shooting star is a bit of kind of cometary grit burning up in the Earth's atmosphere as we plough into it. That is a sort of a stark reminder that we could hit a comet. Our paths do cross, just not at the same time. Fortunately, yeah, and fortunately most comets take a very long time. So the chances of it actually being at that point in, in its orbit when we happen to go past are really very small. Um, so yeah, comets probably we're not going to hit, um, but, but this debris we do indeed hit every year, and sometimes more than once a year. There are a couple of the meteor showers, one in October and the other in May, I think, that are both due to Comet Halley. So we actually intercept the trail of junk left behind by Comet Halley twice a year. Well, how many do we hit? There have been many comets over the years. Like You know, it's comets which have left a lot of stuff behind. A lot of it is things like Halley, which has been around a long time and completed many orbits, so actually has, has lost a lot of its material. And it just happens to be the ones that we, whose paths we intersect, right? Because there are many orbits, orbital paths that don't intersect the Earth's orbit, so actually lots of comets go whizzing past them and we never intersect their orbits. Um, so it's only the ones we happen to intersect that we end up seeing these, these sort of collections of, of, of meteors from. They're like superstar comets, those ones then. I feel like we have a special link to those ones. And actually, they tend to be the ones that are fairly well known. So it's ones like Swift Tuttle, another of these short period comets, so which has been whizzing around many times and left lots of uh, stuff behind it, is one that, that has created meteor showers. I mean, I guess there's a certain persistence of vision thing, right? That you actually see the, the trail of the thing as it, as it flies through the sky. And, you know, mostly you tend to see them in photographs, which obviously tend to be quite long exposures. So you can see the little thing burning up as it travels along. So they're not leaving a trail as such? They do. I mean, they sort of ionise the atmosphere behind them so that they interact with the atmosphere sufficiently energetically that they actually rip electrons off the atoms in the atmosphere. So you can see that then recombining. So you can see some light from that. Some of them seem to actually leave little trails of smoke behind them as they burn up. So you can see quite a lot of kind of phenomena associated with them. They happen throughout the year. My favourite one is the Perseids. Um, and I'll come to why they have the, these weird names they do in a second. But the Percy is my favourite one. The reason why it's my favourite is because it happens in August. I don't feel guilty about telling people go out and observe this fascinating phenomenon in August, right? Because it's nice and warm and you can go and sit outside and watch the shooting stars and it's very pretty. Other hemispheres do exist, Professor. Uh, indeed. I, I apologise, yes, for being hemispherist. Uh, and there are, I'm sure, fine meteor showers that I tend to avoid in the depths of winter in, here in the Northern Hemisphere, which look even better in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay. So there's the Perseids. The ones associated with Halley is called the Orionids, happens in October. So there is these different ones through the year. And you can see they've all got these names that seem to be associated with constellations. So the Perseids, Perseus, Orionids, Orion. And the reason for that is because there is this phenomenon called the radiant point, which is if you go out and observe one of these meteor showers, you'll find that they go out in all directions, but they all seem to originate from a single point. And that single point, for example, for the Orionids is in the constellation of Orion. For the Perseids, it's in the constellation of Perseus. And the reason for that single point is it's just basically it's a perspective effect, that that's the direction in which we're smacking into them. So actually they're all travelling in parallel, 
towards us from that direction. But because they're getting closer as they're traveling parallel, they appear to diverge. It's the same thing with the railway tracks. You know, as railway tracks get closer to you, they get further and further apart. And there's this thing called the vanishing point where they seem to disappear into the horizon. It feels like things like the time of night you hit it and where the earth is would make a difference to those origin points, but the origin points remain the same. In fact, well, you're, no, you're absolutely right. And in fact, so as I said, these meteor showers, although they peak at a particular time, um, they go on for several weeks. And what you'll find is that because the Earth has moved on its orbit during the course of those several weeks, that actually where that radium point is exactly changes a little bit from night to night. Uh, but not a huge amount. It's always within the same constellation. They don't weaken because the, once the Earth's gone through, it's sort of cleared the path for next time. Are we hitting a different part of the trail each time? Or is the path being replenished? Or I mean, they sort of spread out around the orbit and they'll kind of redistribute around it. But actually, exactly where we hit the path, there is diff each time. And sometimes we hit a dense bit of the debris train, which means we get lots and lots of shooting stars, other times that we don't. For some of the of the uh, meteor showers, it's actually quite predictable. So there's one of them which every odd, every 30 odd years suddenly puts on a really good display. Um, for others, it, it's kind of much more random and it's very hard to predict exactly which years are gonna be a good display and which aren't. Do astronauts have to make sure they take cover when we are due to go through one of these sandy trails? Like, will they not schedule a spacewalk or are they not that problematic. I think you'd have to be pretty unlucky again because again you know you look across the entire sky you see a few you know one a minute whereas an astronaut on that scale is absolutely tiny so again an astronaut would have to be very unlucky to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'll ask them I'll ask NASA whether they stay inside <laughs> for any of them. <laughs> well, I, don't yeah. know. I don't know. So the best kit for observing uh, a meteor shower is a deck chair and a duvet are the two primary observing pieces of kit. And the reason why is because actually what you want to do is you want to lie back and just look at the sky, spend, you know, you know, looking up there, because they do fly out in all directions. So you don't want to miss any. You want to be looking at as much sky as you can. So you don't want to be using a telescope looking at a tiny bit of sky. You really want kind of the wide angle view of the sky. And the duvet part is because- a duvet is a blanket, people. I should say, yeah, to yeah. keep you warm, something to keep you warm. Uh, and the reason why you need something to keep you warm is because it takes you a while to get dark adapted to get used to you know, really seeing the very faint things that you've been looking for. And typically it can take up to half an hour to get used to the dark. So you want to be out there for about half an hour, not with no, you know, don't look at your phone, because oh, as soon you, as you look- You can't kill that time looking at Instagram. No, no right. as soon as you start, I mean, you can, you, know, you can listen to your favorite podcast, that's fine, but don't look at anything, because as soon as you look at a light, you lose your dark adaption again. Um, so yeah, about half an hour out there, uh, keeping warm, checking out the sky, and you should start seeing them. Even when there isn't a shower going on, you, they still happen, there are these sporadic uh, meteors that happen all the time, so you actually see the occasional one anyway. There's a very famous meteor shower happened in the 1830s where they were seeing thousands an hour, tens of thousands an hour, huge numbers of these things. This was one of these ones which has these occasional outbursts every 33 years or whatever it is, and this happened to be a particularly spectacular version of that, that kind of outburst, but again, it's very hard to predict exactly how good an outburst is going to be. Was that because it was a particularly like dirty comet or? Exactly, particularly dense train and we happened to be going through the densest part of the dense pile of junk that had been left behind. Nice. You told me about meteors making noise, sound. What's the story? Is this myth and what's going on? What's reported? What's the, what's the allegation first? Okay, so there's, well, actually there's two ways to listen to a meteor, meteor as it goes past. Um, one of which is definitely true and the other of which I'm still not quite sure about. So the one that's definitely true is what you can do is if you've got a little FM radio, tune it to somewhere where there's no radio station. So tune it to somewhere, or at least no local radio station. Because the thing about FM is it doesn't actually travel very far. It kind of requires almost direct line of sight. So actually, if, there's no, if there isn't a local radio station, you'll just hear static. But as these shooting stars go through the atmosphere, they ionize it, so they liberate the electrons, which sort of makes it reflective to radio waves even the low frequency radio waves of FM radio. So an FM radio station that's kind of below the horizon, its radio waves can go up to this trail of the meteor and back down to you again. So even if there's a radio station which is far away that you can't normally hear at all, if a shooting star goes through, it will briefly bounce the signal back down to you. So you're, over a matter of a few seconds, the radio station will fade in and fade back out again. I have played around with this and it really works. You can actually hear shooting stars that way. Okay, I'll take your word for it. That sounds cool. What's the other allegation? So the other allegation, which has been around a long time, it's been reported for centuries, so it's not, if it is, a, you know, if it is a myth, it's a very long-lived myth, is that people actually hear shooting stars, that when a shooting star goes past, they hear a faint hissing sound. And this is weird for a variety of reasons, right? Firstly, because actually, you know, why? What's making the noise? Secondly, these things are happening, what, 40, 50 miles away. 
and yet you hear the hiss immediately. So if it were actually the shooting star itself making a sound, you'd expect it to take you know, tens of seconds for that sound to get to you, but you, that's not what happens. What people report having heard is that when they saw the shooting star, they heard the hissing sound. Sounds like a sort of a, an illusion or, you know. It, that, that, and that's one of the possible explanations, right? That people are actually just, you know, you, 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 hear, you hear a sight, right? That actually there's something in your, your mind for some reason registers it as a sound. It's a perfectly reasonable possibility. But there is actually now a, a possible scientific explanation, which is that as well as reflecting radio waves, this charged path that this shooting star creates behind it actually creates very low frequency radio waves, which obviously will then propagate away from the shooting star at the speed of light rather than the speed of sound, which means effectively they arrive at you almost instantaneously, being only you know, tens of miles away. And these radio waves can be supposedly sufficiently intense that they'll actually interact with the material in your environment and make it vibrate a bit. If you had, I don't know, something metal near you, then it might vibrate a little bit, even sort of uh, biological things, so if they've got water in them, will actually, the, the radio wave, remember a radio wave is a, a kind of a, an oscillating electric field, that will exert a force on it and maybe make the leaves rustle a tiny bit. And so the idea is that maybe those low frequency radio waves interacting with your environment actually creates that little faint background sound for just a matter of a second or so. What do you think? I, I, I'll, I'll wait until I hear it myself, I think. I've never actually heard this phenomenon, but it's been so widely reported that it's either kind of a mass psychosis thing or really is some physics going on there. That was astonishing. Now the difficulty is that the exposure was wrong and it doesn't come out as green. It may oversaturate. There, there, whoa, yes! <laughs> You got it. You got it, baby. You got in a bit closer for you there. That's just that's just the most beautiful thing. I'm, oh, I'm very, very pleased with that. High five, high five. <laughs> <laughs>